lot of pressure there to make us, you know, agree with him. He assumes. We see it that way. He assumes that he's writing to Christians whom he knows will treasure God. You see, Peter assumes we don't want to waste our lives. He assumes his hearers don't want to glorify the wrong things, live for the wrong ambitions. And that's why Peter follows up that passage from last week that might be some of the hardest teaching in the New Testament. Hardest to swallow anyway. (laughs) Would you agree? Be subject to every human institution. Just wait till two weeks from now. But he follows up a really hard passage there with a rhetorical question. Look at verse 20. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? Stop there. The word credit is about reputation or, you guessed it, fame. Or glory. In one sense, he's asking rhetorically, does it look good, do you think? Does it look good? When you get caught doing wrong and you endure the punishment, does that look good? And of course, he believes his readers, people living under an empire who was an emperor who was hostile to Christianity, people living under local governors who were pagans and unfriendly to Christians, even writing in those audiences of those churches in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia, the places that Peter is writing to, in those churches there were slaves, probably many. And even the slaves who were indentured because of debt or war, probably to service of masters who were sometimes unfair and abusive, maybe cruel. All those people hearing what Peter wrote to those churches, Peter is thinking they will agree that it doesn't look good to get punished for doing what is wrong. Enduring a fair punishment doesn't make you look good, right? But, Peter takes it farther. That was the first half of verse 20. Look what he says next. Never mind what makes you and me look good, what makes God look good? In verse 20, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, then what? This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Remember, he started by asking if it was any credit at the beginning of verse 20. If it was any credit, if it looked good or made for a good reputation when we endure punishment for doing wrong. But he says next, if you do good and are still punished, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Or literally, according to the Greek, he is saying this is grace before God. In other words... When Christians live like that, there's only one way to explain it. When Christians live like that, doing good and even because of that, enduring suffering, it shows that God's grace is at work in our lives. There is grace from God. There is grace before God. There is grace in the presence of God that God can see that's active in that kind of Christian's life. What credit is that? If it makes God look glorious because of the power of his grace changing us, leading us to respond to injustice with obedience, leading us to respond to abuse with prayer for our enemies. How does that look? How does it make God look? It shows the power of his grace in and through us. And so it makes God look glorious. So Peter in verse 20 assumed 
that his readers would not want to glorify the wrong sorts of things, living lives that value and, and like Gollum with that ring show that this is precious to me when I cling to this sin. He assumed that we Christians would not want to waste our lives on the wrong things. He assumed it. But then he tells us something that we need to learn. He tells his readers something about God's grace. How it helps us. How it shapes our lives. How it makes God look glorious as his grace works through us. And he doesn't assume this time that we already agree. Because you know what? Even if we're wired to, to agree with him, even if we're predisposed to go, oh yeah, that sounds probably true, we forget. He doesn't assume this. He wants to teach us this. Because this is something that all followers of Christ need to learn again and again and again. So in verse 21... He puts out a call to all Christians. Maybe that's not quite right. Maybe he just acknowledges there is a call to all Christians. Look at verse 21 with me. For to this you have been called. You and I want to ask, does God have a purpose for my life? What's my mission? You and I want to look around and see if we can find some kind of fulfillment, some kind of career path that satisfies me, some kind of work that makes me happy, something that makes me seem important. Let me confess to you, part of my motivation when I first started thinking about being a pastor was because I thought it would look good. Was I ever stupid? And now you're agreeing with me. Look at verse 21. To this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. Why? So that, he says, so that you might follow in his steps. If you are Christians, says Peter, this is your calling, no exceptions. So ask yourself, am I a Christian? Not, not Joe, ask yourself. In your own words, am I a Christian? What's the answer to that question? No exceptions. If you are a Christian, this is your calling. To this you have been called. To what? See, this is part and parcel of being saved by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can't be a gospel-saved Christian. You can't be a Christian who believes the gospel and ignore this calling. This calling includes the gospel. Faith in the gospel is part of it. Forget the salvation by faith or works thing, okay? Just for a minute. Look at what he's saying. First, he says in verse 21, the gospel, what all Christians are called to, requires trust in Christ as our substitute. Okay, for those of you who are theologically sharp, do you want to say amen on that point? The gospel requires trust in Christ as our substitute. Amen. Yes! Look at verse 21 of the first part of the verse. He says it right there. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you. For you. He suffered the suffering you and I deserved. Right? He took our place for you. To this you have been called because Christ suffered for you. You have to believe as a Christian that Jesus took our place. You have to believe his death was the death you earned. You have to believe that the death he, earned, the death he died was because you earned death through your sin. And I did through my sin. He took our place. Do we believe it? Well, he moves on. He says, that's not all that you're called to. The second thing you're called to is that the gospel requires obedience to Christ's example. The gospel, I didn't say God requires it. I didn't say justification requires it. I didn't say to get saved, it requires obedience. I said the gospel requires. 
requires obedience to Christ's example. Look at verse 21 again. Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. He left an example. To this you were called. You agree that he says you were called to this? And you agree that it says, Peter says, Christ left us an example. You agree with both those propositions? Okay, you're stuck now. Look at the next point. And Peter shows us Jesus left the example so that we might follow in his footsteps. It's not just an example that we acknowledge is there. Oh yeah, what would Jesus do? (laughs) My bracelet does not say that. We don't don't just say, yeah, Jesus is a good example. We should, you know, it's really the ideal that we follow Christ's example. No, he says, Christ left an example so that you will follow in his, what? We can't really get around this because Peter said, to this you were called. How do we follow in Christ's footsteps? I want to suggest it's by living a life like in verse 19. For this is a gracious thing. Again, the Greek says, for this is grace. When mindful of God, with your mind on God, because of God, as a servant of God, for the glory of God. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. And I want to suggest further that it's not only like that, it's also like verse 20. It's by living a life like verse 20. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is grace in the sight of God. The life that glorifies God, that makes God look good, is a life that not only believes the gospel, you were called to this, to believe the gospel, Christ suffered for you. The life that glorifies God, that makes God look that good, is a life that believes the gospel and a life that results from believing the gospel. That kind of life magnifies Oh, it shows off God's grace. A life that is changed because of the gospel demonstrates to the people who can see who God is. See, this isn't fatalism. Because you remember that Peter is telling us to be subject to every human institution back in verse 13. Every, every authority. But I want to reassure you, this is not fatalism, just putting up with our lot in life. This is purpose, this is intention, this is a mission in living for God and to show what God is like by how we live lives that are changed by the gospel we believe. So it's not wrong to ask God to take the suffering from us. And I know some of you are in that boat. It wasn't wrong for Christians to pray for a better Caesar. And we know they did. And it wasn't wrong for Christian slaves to pray for their freedom. But it is so right. And it is so full of grace when we endure the hardships that God leads us to. When we endure those hardships... When that endurance makes God's grace look good. It's so right. Hard teaching? What do you think? Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Beginning in verse 8. Paul says, three times I asked. No, he didn't say that. Verse 8, Paul says, for 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8, three times I pleaded. Three times I pleaded 
with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. The thing that's provoking his suffering, the thing that's causing him hardship. Verse 9, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. It's enough. It's all you need. For my power is made perfect in weakness. That's what God said. And Paul concludes, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In the grace of God, for to this you have been called, brothers and sisters, to a life that believes the gospel of Jesus Christ and to live a life following Christ's example because of the power of the gospel that's changing us. Because it's grace at work in us, in the sight of God. I know you don't, I know you wish it was a different message, but can you say amen anyway? Because I need your encouragement right now. So how does the gospel glorify God? Remember the premise way back at verse 12. Peter's telling us to live lives that will one day lead to God's glory as people can see how we're living and worship, come to worship one day on by judgment day, the God that we serve. He wants our lives to glorify God. So how does the gospel glorify God? Peter assumed we would want to... That's the next slide. Okay, come on. Ty, Nick, can I have a hand there on the space bar? Peter assumed that we would want to glorify God. Or arrow. Thanks, Glenn. And he explained that the gospel we believed is powerful enough to help us follow Christ's example. That we could actually have the power to follow those footsteps. He assumed the first thing that we would want to glorify God. And he taught us the second thing, where to find the power to do so. See, a life that endures suffering with our eyes on God's glory, empowered by God's grace. That's the kind of life we're called to. Like Jesus. And then Peter fixes his reader's attention on Jesus himself. What I don't want is for someone to come away from a message like this thinking about how I have to follow Jesus' example. No. What I want is for someone to come away from a message thinking Jesus is magnificent. Because it's the worship of him. It's the enjoyment of the grace that we find in his gospel that will give us the power to walk in his footsteps. If we worship the footsteps, if we worship the obedience, if we admire the self-discipline that somehow manages to control ourselves and live a godly, righteous life, we're becoming idol worshipers of holiness. Not worshipers of Christ and followers of him. You can't follow in Jesus' footsteps without looking at Jesus. I mean, you could, but you're faking it. It doesn't bring him glory. How does the gospel glorify God? Peter focuses us on Jesus himself here. If the gospel we believe is the message about Jesus Christ, how did Jesus glorify God? And Peter gives us four answers. Jesus glorified God through his innocence, through his obedience, through his atonement, and through his accomplishment. And the first thing we see is Jesus' innocence in verse 22. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And he's the only one in human history. Being sinless meant that Jesus always loved God more than anything. 
more than the things that attract the eye, more than the things that the flesh craves, more than the pride and the admiration that the heart seeks. And then Peter says, no deceit was found in his mouth. No deceit means Jesus was always truthful. (laughs) Okay, think about your own life. I'm thinking about my week. Okay, I could probably just cover yesterday. Think about your life. How can someone live a life with no deceit coming from this mouth? Let me tell you how. Because nothing has the power to tempt Jesus to lie. When the God Jesus serves, the Father he loves is so great. Nothing has the power to tempt Jesus away from the Father's love. Why did Jesus obey the Father, John tells us? Because he loved him. He showed the love he had for the Father by his obedience. So no temptation, no threat, no pleasure, no offer, nothing had the power to make Jesus fall for that, that lying is the best way to achieve that. No deceit was found in his mouth. How did Jesus' innocence glorify God? (laughs) He showed that God's better than any reason to lie. He showed that God's better than any sin. And he followed his father every day of his life on earth. The second thing, Jesus glorified God in the gospel by Jesus' obedience. How did Jesus' subjection, and I said obedience here, different from righteousness, on purpose, because back in verse 13, (laughs) Peter says that crazy command, be subject, be obedient to every human institution and it's funny if it wasn't so sad and tragic that, that's the one thing we want to disagree with in the book of okay there's two things in the book of first peter we really take issue with and the call to that kind of radical obedience is definitely one of them look at it verse 23 when he was reviled He did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. When he was mocked, Jesus, when he was mocked and when he was abused by the Jews, by the crowds, by the Roman soldiers, Jesus had no need to respond in kind. Why? This is how he glorified God. He knew that God would vindicate him. He endured the suffering of the cross. The writer of Hebrews says, despising its shame. Meaning that Jesus wasn't swayed by the fear of being rejected by those people. The people spitting at him and mocking him and whipping him. Jesus wasn't afraid of being rejected by them. Why? Because the approval of the Father was so much better. The love and adoration of the Father eclipsed anything else. That same verse in Hebrews 12 too says that Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. The joy, the happiness. He knew and believed that the greatest happiness could only come through obeying his father. So going through with the mission that his father gave to him, even to death, was happiness for Jesus. He endured the cross for the sake of the joy set before him. So that even when it looked like he was going to die at the hands of people who hated him, Jesus knew he was in God's hands. Right? He kept on, verse 23 says, he continued entrusting himself. He kept on consciously turning himself over to God's protection even through death. And how did this glorify God? All this subjection, all this obedience of Christ because the righteous verdict of his father, the only just judge, That when God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That verdict was the fuel that kept Jesus going. And it was the only thing that mattered. It meant so much more to Jesus than what the court of the high priest had to say or what the governor Pilate would decide. His life was in God's hands and no one else's. Make no mistake. Make no mistake. 
God would judge justly. Which meant that the perfectly righteous Jesus Christ would not only be vindicated, but that through Jesus loving God like that, even through death, the loveliness and the glory of God was vindicated. Jesus proved how great God is by the way he followed him through the cross. How did Jesus glorify God in his subjection? That's how. He's a God worth obeying all the time. Next, Jesus glorified God through his atonement. How did the result of Jesus' death glorify God? The atonement is the result of Jesus' death. That's what I mean. How did that glorify God? Look at the second part of verse 24. I see I skipped a point, but you can catch up. Thank you. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Jesus could always see that his father, we can't see this. I think because of the sin that clouds our eyes and confuses our heart, but Jesus could always see that his father was more worthy of loving of enjoying, of glorifying than anything else. Oh, to see God like that. Really? Oh, to see God like that. And when he took the punishment of our sin, that sacrifice, that act meant that God could forgive us Instead of destroying us, when Jesus suffered for us, when he took the punishment that our sins deserved, there's no more punishment. The wrath of God is satisfied being poured out on the Son of God on that cross. So God can forgive us. It's possible because of that for God to forgive us. God can still be just and holy and merciful. How did Jesus' atonement glorify God? This made it possible for God to give us his spirit, for God to give us new hearts, so that we could learn to see God like Jesus saw God. That we could learn to see him and love him like Jesus saw him and loved him. That's how it glorifies God. This is what is meant by living to righteousness. That... I used to be dead to righteousness. I didn't want it. I wanted sin. Now I'm dead to sin because I see it's a lie. And I'm alive to righteousness, which is to love God and his ways. That's only possible because I'm forgiven, because God's given me his Holy Spirit, which was only made possible because Jesus took my place. Praise God that Jesus died to cover my sin, that his death is my covering, my atonement. The more of us that like this, we follow Christ, we're born again by the Spirit, we have put our trust in Jesus' substitution, in the penal substitutionary atonement of the living Christ. More of us that come to confess Jesus like this and we learn to love God by what he's doing in our hearts, more of us that do that, the more God is glorified. And finally, Jesus' accomplishment. How did the result of Jesus' death, if the atonement is the result of Jesus' death, how did that death lead to a consequence that glorifies God? This is Jesus' accomplishment. Look at the second part of verse 24. By his wounds. What does Peter say? By his wounds, what? Who? You. Peter's readers. By his wounds, you have been healed. This is a quote from Isaiah 53 5, which everyone has memorized. <clears throat> so you right away spot that there's a problem. To say that Jesus finished what the scripture promised he would do doesn't necessarily make it true for you. There's an element missing between what Jesus accomplished 
and it making a difference in your life and in mine. It has to be applied. By taking our place, our sin, our death, Jesus purchased for us. He gave us the place, the approval of God and the everlasting life that Jesus deserved. We were broken. We need to be healed. And Peter says in this verse, you have now been healed. You Christians, you followers of Christ, you who are called to this gospel and to this grace of the gospel that changes you. You have now been healed. If you believe it. We were doomed. Jesus has saved us. Isaiah 53 5 is so marvelous. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. 600 years before Christ, Isaiah wrote that. And Jesus fulfilled it. How does it glorify God when Jesus saves people? When Jesus takes their place? By showing forth this truth that God is the judge who judges sin. God is the judge who judges evil. He deals with it. He never takes a bribe. He never winks at what is wrong. And by showing that God is loving and gracious and quick to forgive. He is merciful and patient. More than any other time in world history. And think about that just for a second. Of all the things that have ever happened, there's one time stands out as the time when God was shown to be most glorious, most amazing. When the Son of God died on that cross, Jesus showed the glory of God. That's how God was glorified when Christ died on that cross. God is just, he is righteous, and he is loving and merciful. Both. That's how our healing displays how wonderful God is in Jesus Christ. When we believe it. When it's applied. By his wounds. You have now been healed. If you believe it. And lastly, this gospel reminds us to want God to be glorified. Peter doesn't have to tell us to think that. He just needed to remind us why we should want it. The gospel reminds us to want God to be glorified. Verse 25, the last verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, comes from the next verse in Isaiah 53, verse 6. But it's not an exact quote. Look at verse 25 with me. Peter says, For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You were straying like sheep. Peter changes Isaiah's words. Isaiah said, All we like sheep have gone astray. Peter says, You were straying like sheep. So his point is not that... Not that... um, I just lost my train of thought. His... (laughs) Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. Right. Uh, So Peter's point is not that we are lost. We aren't lost. If we are followers of Jesus Christ, if we are confessing the name of Jesus, if we have believed in his gospel, we aren't lost. That's not Peter's point. His point is to show that now we are found. We're found. He's reminding his readers who God is and what what God has done through Jesus. And how much God loves us. How much God will take care of us even through the suffering in our life. Even through death. And you know what? Into a million years of happiness. He started this reminder. Peter did back in verse 20. Look at it one more time. He started this reminder in verse 20 by asking us to think about what glory is there when we endure suffering on account of our own sin. And he knew that we only needed to be reminded how wonderful God is. And we only discovered that through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we only discover how wonderful God is in the gospel of Jesus Christ by focusing on Jesus Christ. What he did and who he is. 
We needed that reminder so that we would want to glorify God, that we would agree that it's better to obey God, to live good lives, to follow the footsteps of Christ, and to show off how wonderful and glorious our God really is. Do we want that? I'm appealing. Do we want that? I think Peter was right. That's my brilliant conclusion. Christ's death made it possible for our sinful hearts to begin to learn to love God like that. To this you were called. To follow that example. To love God like that in innocence and righteousness and obedience. And hope that we would continually entrust ourselves to the God who judges justly. To know that we, are, we were he- broken, but now we have been returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. We've been healed. For the next 10 million years, we will sing that glorious truth. And then we'll get better at it for the next 10 million. Does this gospel stir your heart? I sure hope so, because Christians are called to this. It's our calling, all of us. To believe these things about Jesus, to trust Jesus, to follow Jesus' example in the power of God's grace. So we fix our eyes on God, Peter said, mindful of him. We live like servants of God, following the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And our hope, in addition to all that, through the way we live our lives, is that as God glorifies his grace by making us a little bit more like Jesus that friends and family and loved ones, lost ones, that they might see the way we live and recognize there's some power at work I can't explain. It must be God. Even spouses and neighbors And those in authority over us, even when it's unfair, what if they saw and turned? Even kings and rulers and slave masters and abusive employers, what if they saw that grace and believed it? It's our hope that they will. That they would come to believe that same gospel, that they would too would be called to this. That they who are still lost and wandering will also be returned to the shepherd and overseer of their souls. That's what Jesus did for us. When he showed us what God is like. I close from a parable in Luke 14, Luke 15. He told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after that one that is lost until he finds it. And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Father, we trust that as your word does its work in our hearts and in in our minds, reminding us again of the glorious gospel of your Son, that your Holy Spirit would take this conviction, take this motivation, take this, this building up and this encouragement and use it, Lord, to lead us into following the footsteps of your Son, his holiness, his perfection, his righteousness, his love for you. Lord, would you teach us to do what Jesus did in this way, that as his eyes were always on you, would you help us to keep our eyes on him? Do this by the power of your Holy Spirit who is ministering to us to help us glorify Jesus. And do this, Lord, and we also pray that some will come to salvation and come to believe this same gospel because you are working in our lives. We praise you that you would use sinners like us. We thank you for your glorious grace. You are a wonderful God and we bless your name. In the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen.